Okay, so here we're going to cover the steady flow energy equation, and it's a what we're going to do is pull together lots of information that we've used in different parts of the module. So we're going to make use of the first law for flow systems. So this was where we used it for uh, internal combustion engines, and we assumed a system. So with a system, it's a fixed mass, and there's no mass and momentum transfer in and out of the system uh, by definition. And it's going to be slightly different because the first law effectively was an energy conservation law, whereas we are interested in the rate of change of energy. So um, if you like the first law, um, the derivative of the first law with respect to time. And we need to get from the Lagrangian system point of view to uh, an Eulerian control point of view and we're going to make use of the Reynolds transport theorem and the other thing that we need to add to the first law is convection um, of energy and from the Bernoulli equation we know that energy has different forms it not only has a form of temperature but pressure and kinetic energy and potential energy and these energy forms we are going to find out are going are able to be convected uh, into the into and out of the control volume by the flow, so a uh, little sort of conceptual leap we need to make here, and you're going to get this equation in the exam, so you don't need to learn it, but uh, you're going to have to simplify it to do um, typical engineering type problems. Uh, so the last piece of this lecture is really about how you're going to be able to use it, and this is um, where you need to be able to be aware of what's going on. Okay, so um, let's remind ourselves what uh, the first law is. Um, so key point is it's a system, so it's a fixed mass. Um, and the only thing that we were conserving effectively is thermal energy, heat. And we said there were three terms on the first law. Uh, one was a, a transfer of thermal energy across the system boundary, so like you were heating it. And the second one was uh, work that the system gets done on it or it does on the environment. So classically for uh, the heat engines, uh, this is when the system expanded or contracted um, and that created uh, some work, PDV. Uh, and the sum of these two things um, effectively creates a change in energy of the system mass. So effectively it's temperature. And the sign convention, if you remember, was positive um, into the system for energy, thermal energy. So if you add energy uh, to the system, you heat it up, that, that change is positive. And if the work is positive when the system does work on the environment, so effectively when the, when the engine cylinder uh, expands, uh, it's, it's doing positive work on, on, on the environment. Uh, and this kind of follows the standard sort of sensible convention for a heat engine. Um, and if you remember the first law, Q minus W equal to uh, change in internal energy. And a key point is that there's no time information here. So effectively what the first law says is if, you, if I've got energy at a certain state um, and, I've got, and then I've got energy in a final state, this is, if you like, the change in internal energy. And and between state one and state two there is a certain amount of heat that's transferred and a certain amount of work uh, that's transferred to the system. But there's no information on how quickly that happens and we get around that for heat engines, uh, if you like internal combustion engines, by um, playing around with um, uh, the, the, the speed of the engine, the number of revolutions per second. Okay, so we're, we need to go from that to uh, the steady flow energy equation and there are a number of differences. So the first one is that the energy, uh, the steady flow energy equation is a, is a rate equation. So we are interested in the rate at which energy is changing, not the change of energy from state one to state two. Okay, so uh, that's the first change. The second change is we're not using a system anymore because that's too restrictive. We are using a control volume 
and um, as you know from the lecture we did on convection diffusion of energy and the development of Peckrate number um, uh, we, we effectively we can transfer energy into and out of this control volume by convection diffusion so we need to ensure that our steady flow energy equation can account for these and uh, so the way we do that is the diffusion of energy we sort of borrow Q from the first law and we say that that's uh, diffusion of energy into the control volume um, across a temperature difference and we handle E so the, ch the rate of change of energy uh, in uh, the first law we all of our convective transfer of energy um, in the first law is dealt with by this um, the change in energy okay and this has to this this rate of change of energy of the control volume this has to uh, include all the forms of energy that we know so we know about thermal energy and we also know about mechanical energy uh, from the Bernoulli equation so we've got pressure we've got kinetic energy and we've got potential energy so all of these four forms of energy um, are included in the steady flow energy equation and then that leaves uh, W so W is the work that is done um, to change the energy of the fluid in the control volume by um, non-convective means uh, and non-diffusive means so classic example might be if you electrically heat a uh, fluid um, then um, you, you, you would do that using the work term or if you want to add fluid pressure so if you like pressure energy you might do that through a pump uh, and you would power that pump um, with some electrical power so you can use work to, to deal with those kind of systems so these are sort of classic examples of how you might use uh, Q and W in the steady flow energy equation. So we said that Q is heat conduction. Um, so let's say we have a burner. It looks a bit like this. Um, uh, so we've got cold fluid going in here. Uh, and hopefully, if our boiler is working correctly, we have hot fluid going out the top. Uh, and we've got a heating system underneath. And we're transferring energy from the burner into... Um, the, the chamber with the fluid. So my control volume is this kind of dotted uh, line uh, and clearly you can see that there is a thermal transfer of energy from the burner into the fluid in this control volume. So we would handle that using uh, the Q term. And work, so if you can imagine we've got a pump and let's say we draw a control volume around this pump we've got um, low pressure fluid going into the control volume and we've got high pressure fluid uh, coming out of the control volume so this fluid has gained uh, pressure energy and to balance to do an energy conservation law we have to add something to, to account for that so what we're doing is we're adding uh, electrical work um, to, to, to balance this change in energy of, of the fluid Okay, so that's how we handle the left-hand side of the steady flow energy equation. Uh, the tricky bit is how we deal with the right-hand side, the convective terms. So let's start thinking about what we've got here. So here's my um, kind of model model system. Uh, and this has got all the things in it that um, I need to deal with in terms of the steady flow energy equation. So I've got a chamber here where I have a certain amount of mass uh, and a certain amount of specific energy flowing in uh, from two forms uh, and a and certain amount of energy get flowing out and another certain amount of energy flowing out a certain amount of mass here. And I might be heating uh, this, this, this fluid in this chamber and I might be doing some electrical work on it uh, as well. So if this is my control volume the dashed line you can see that there is um, some energy being convected into this control volume because the convective flux is the mass flow times the specific energy so this if you multiply the mass by the uh, specific energy this gives you um, a, a convective flux of energy 
um, uh, which is uh, joules per second. Okay, so effectively, energy is flowing in at at a certain rate through that through this in, inflow, and the same for all of these. And these things have to be balanced by the amount of energy flowing in and the amount of uh, work flowing in. Okay, so um, how do we do this uh, when we get from the first law? Okay, so for the first law, the right-hand side of our um, um, first law was, was, was this term, which represented the change in internal energy from state one uh, to state two due to a certain amount of heat transfer and a certain amount of work. Okay, so we take this, but we say that this EU isn't just thermal energy. This is all of the different types of energy. Okay, so um, and so the first thing we do is we say this ET, this is this is the this is the energy um, where it's the sum of all of the four energy forms that we've we've got: thermal energy, potential energy kinetic energy uh, pressure energy and we know these from the Bernoulli equation uh, and then we say well okay so this and then we've got our system and then what is the rate what's the rate of change of this total energy in my system how is it represented well I would use the material derivative for that so this is the Lagrangian um, uh, derivative so if you can imagine I've got my system and it's kind of floating around in space and how does it change its energy uh, in time well that's represented by the material derivative and if you can't remember what the material derivative actually represents um, go back to the start of the lectures uh, and read up on it okay and the next thing we want to be able to do is we want to say well I know what it is for a system I want to um, make an equivalent statement for the Reynolds transport theorem. Okay, so we've got this already. We've covered this already. So this um, this equation here is the Reynolds transport theorem. So what this says in words is this is the rate of change of energy in my system that might be moving around in space, um, and it might be changing shape or size and uh, this is in terms of Eulerian derivatives so derivatives that are a function of um, space and time in the Eulerian sense so the first thing we've got we've got an Eulerian uh, derivative with respect to uh, the volume in the control volume the, the energy in the control volume okay and so effectively what this term handles is if I'm in a control volume um, is the energy in that control volume changing with respect to time so this is really the accumulation term it, it is is the energy in the in a control volume changing as a function of time and this term this is um, the uh, this is telling you how what's the relative flow of energy into uh, the control volume so for instance back to this slide if if it turns out for instance that the energy flowing into the control volume through this port and plus this port is equal to the amount of energy flowing out through this port and this port the net flux of energy flowing into and out of um, this uh, control volume uh, is zero and so this term would be zero okay um, and just to sort of remind ourselves this is my extensive energy and I and this is the same as my uh, intensive variable multiplied by density uh, and volume so that's what we've got here effectively okay and then we make the assumption that we are not dealing with unsteady problems in this in this uh, energy conservation law so that means we can get rid of this so what this means what this assumption means is that it's always a steady state problem so the energy um, of the control volume never changes in time so that means we can we can drop this term we can set it to zero 
and then we can say our um, Lagrangian derivative of energy is actually just dependent on the amount of energy flowing in and out through by convection. Okay, so in total, my steady flow energy equation looks like uh, this. So these things are the rate at which uh, thermal energy is diffusing uh, across the control volume boundary. And this is the amount of uh, non-flow work being done. So this um, across the control volume surface, and this is the net uh, convection of energy. Um, so the next thing we need to do is to make this term uh, a bit more simple. Um, because this is the general case where we've got viscous flows and we are going to be working with inviscid flows in uh, steady flow energy equation problems. Okay, so let's, let's make uh, this more simple. Um, so just remember that the mass flow is, um, um, it, it is the velocity times the dot product of the vector area. So you can also write this as u vector dot n vector um, times dA scalar. So n is the unit normal. And u dot n gives you the normal velocity of that. So that's this term here. Okay, so um, if you can make the assumption that the flow is inviscid um, and therefore the flow velocity across one of these control volume uh, inlets and outlets uh, is the same, you can write this uh, as this, which is much easier. So this is the density of the fluid, this is the velocity normal to the inflow or outflow face, and this is the area of the inflow and the outflow face. And the rate of energy flowing across this um, uh, inlet or outlet is, is simply the mass times the specific total energy. So the units of this term are joules per second. And this ET, this is the sum of all of the various energy um, flavors or components that we're, in, that we're after. So we can simplify this to, to this. Okay, so we've got... Uh, We've got the sum of all the flow outlets minus the sum of the flow inlets. So we've got two flow inlets and two flow outlets, um, and it looks like looks in in this way. So some um, so you may think this is a little bit odd because you've got out minus in is equal to something on on the left, but this is kind of the traditional way of, of writing this equation, and you can make you can write it in a different way um, by moving this term to uh, the left hand side and then the steady flow energy equation reads the sum of all the inlet mass flow inlet energy um, minus the sum of all the outlet energy plus q minus w equals zero and so some of you might find that that's a sort of more sensible way of thinking about this Okay, so uh, so we've we've now sort of simplified our step. We've got our master steady flow energy equation. So now we start need to start thinking about the energy forms. So this E T is specific energy. Uh, this is joules per kilogram. So um, we've got various different components. Uh, we've got the internal energy. So this is effectively the temperature of the fluid. Uh, we've got the kinetic energy. Uh, we've got the pressure energy. Uh, and we've got potential energy. So all of these things, and this is the sort of the tricky bit of the lecture, is all of these forms of energy can be carried into the, the control volume by the flow. So this kind of makes sense for things like um, internal energy because you can think, well, I've got a long pipe uh, and I have hot fluid going in one end of the pipe and this hot fluid will travel down the pipe and it will come out the other end. So energy is sort of transporting, or well, the flow is transporting this thermal energy. Yeah. Um, but it's a bit more difficult with um, pressure and uh, potential energy. So effectively, if you've got a pipe which has uh, a different inlet height and a different exit height, effectively you've got fluid of one potential energy flowing into the pipe and fluid of another potential energy flowing out. And there's a difference in energy of the inflow and the outflow due to the height difference between these two exits. And that's the kind of the spirit of where this 
convective energy flow comes from. <clears throat> okay, so this allows us to um, deal with energy in this kind of component form like this. And um, so I, I, I've given the example of um, uh, potential energy. Another good example uh, is, a, is a waterfall. And uh, this is a, the point at which enthalpy starts to become very useful for us because if we've got pressure, if we've got uh, temperature over here and uh, pressure and density over here, we can represent that as enthalpy. This is our definition uh, of enthalpy. And this makes calculations in steady flow energy problems very much easier because we just replace this with CPT. Okay, so if you can imagine you have a, a pump and you have uh, an, the flow going into the pump is a certain temperature and pressure uh, and density and then it goes through the pump and um, it has a certain pressure and density and temperature coming out. If you use this full form of the steady flow energy equation you've got to work out T and P and rho. So if you use enthalpy so effectively you scrub this term out and put a P here you just have to worry about the temperature difference. You don't have to worry about the pressure and the density changes across the pump. So this saves you some time, makes things a lot easier. And the other kind of warning is um, to do with uh, units. So when you typically, when you work out kinetic energy, you end up working out, um, working out in joules. And typically when you work out thermal energy, if you're not careful, you can easily work out in kilojoules. So if you add these two things together, your answers are out by a factor of 1,000. Um, so be careful with SI units. Whenever you're using steady flow energy equation, just check everything is in joules. Um, so the other point, this pressure energy. So some textbooks add a second work term um, onto the uh, steady flow energy equation. So what they have, they have Q minus work shaft, they normally call it, which is my non-flow work. And then they have another work term over here, which is the pressure work term, which is effectively this P over rho term. So I don't do this because I say my work is all my non-flow work, and I want to keep my P over rho term here because I want to make use of enthalpy and make my uh, life uh, a lot easier but some textbooks have two work terms in their steady flow energy equations so be careful of those so just to try and explain uh, the pressure energy and where it comes from uh, effectively we have uh, we have a pressure on a control volume surface and there's a certain area so that gives us uh, a force and during a time interval um, the flow moves uh, a certain distance, uh, dx2. Um, so there is um, a certain amount of work being done. Force times distance is energy. So small amount of energy is being done because this force moves a, a little bit in a little time. Um, and so you end up with this term here. So we've got pressure times area. So this is the force. Uh, and this thing here is the distance. And if I divide both sides by uh, delta T and then sort of take the limit, I end up with um, an equation here that says uh, the rate of change of energy is actually equal to the pressure times the area uh, times the velocity. And um, if I divide and multiply by density, so I end up with this term, I can write that effectively this is P over rho times the mass flow. And this is where this P over rho thing uh, comes from in the steady flow uh, energy equation. So you have one of these on each of the exits because effectively um, the pressure is going to be different on different uh, flow exits, usually due to the flow speeding up or slowing down. Okay. So, um, so the main uh, sort of thrust of the lecture is, is well, what do you do with all of this? How, how do you handle it? Um, and this is really how 
I want you to be able to use the steady flow energy equation uh, in questions. So this is the equation that you get in your in your uh, formula book for your for your exam. Uh, we've got the rate at which thermal energy is being uh, transferred to the control volume, the rate at which work is being done, and then we've got the amount of energy flowing out of the control volume, uh, and this is down to the enthalpy, uh, and the kinetic energy, uh, and the potential energy, uh, and similar things for the um, f flow coming uh, in. Okay. Um, so uh, if you're going to do this for a boiler, you can make some assumptions. Um, so the first one is uh, you can um, uh, you can say that there are, there are only two ports, so one in, one outlet and one inlet. Uh, there's no work being done. You can almost always assume that the potential and the kinetic energy changes are, are negligible, and uh, there's going to be some heat being added. So Q is positive. So effectively, what we've got is uh, we've got a thermal transfer uh, by diffusion, um, and this changes the enthalpy of the gas. And effectively, what it does, it makes the enthalpy bigger. Okay, and if you think about what the enthalpy is, it's the internal energy plus the pressure. Pre the pr it's the internal energy plus P over rho. So with a boiler. Most of the time, the pressure going in and the pressure going out is pretty much the same. So the enthalpy change associated with a heat transfer is mainly the CVT terms on the P over rho. Um, so the next one is a pump or a turbine uh, or, a, or a compressor. So a pump and a turbine um, add work and a turbine extracts work um, from the flow. Uh, so here's my uh, invisible uh, steady flow st steady form uh, steady flow energy equation, and the, and the task is to simplify it. So what assumptions can we make? We've only got one inflow and one outflow. We've got no thermal uh, energy being transferred to the control volumes here. Um, most of the time, uh, you can assume its potential kinetic energies are negligible, and um, um, and then there is some work being done. So if it's a pump um, or a compressor, you're adding energy to the fluid. So, um, so you have minus W being uh, added. Um, so that would make this term positive. And typically what you're doing is you're increasing the pressure. So your steady flow energy equation simplifies to this. And again, we've got the work being done that changes the enthalpy. And then if you think about the enthalpy, it's the change uh, of the internal energy and the pressure. So effectively, what you're doing is you're changing the pressure here. So the enthalpy change is pretty much defined by a pressure change across the pump. Okay, And then you can make a simplification for uh, an incompressible fluid because uh, there's no real temperature change at all. And the work just increases the pressure directly. Okay, um, so the next one um, is if you try and speed up or slow down the fluid. Um, so we know about this from the Bernoulli equation, really. So we know from the Bernoulli equation that um, if you have a flow going through a nozzle and it's speeding up, um, so the kinetic energy is going to increase here, uh, and therefore the pressure must decrease. So you can represent this process using the inviscid form of uh, the steady flow energy equation. So here we, we've got one inflow, we've got one outflow, we've got um, no thermal or work being done on the fluid, um, uh, no potential energy, and normally we can ignore one of the kinetic energies, but we can't ignore um, what, we have to use one of them, and it depends whether it's an inlet, uh, sorry, uh, a nozzle uh, or a diffuser. So with a, with a nozzle, effectively what you're doing is you're taking high pressure fluid and you're cr trying to create kinetic energy. So in that case, um, effectively you, you neglect your inlet kinetic energy um, and your outlet kinetic energy is effectively the change in the, um, in the enthalpy. Okay, so this is used for a jet engine. This is the exit of a jet engine using, used to sort of create our thrust. <coughs> and if we're doing this with uh, a nozzle, um, you can um, you, 
normally you can neglect the temperature difference um, and then you can try and recover the the, the, um, the kinetic the Bernoulli equation and here what we've done here is we've neglected the inlet kinetic energy okay um, and you can do um, thermal transfers so for instance if we've got uh, two streams one hot uh, and one cold and you want to transfer heat from one of the stream to the other you put it through a heat exchanger and you've got your steady flow energy equation and if we say well here's my control volume um, where, what's going through my control volume surface effectively I've got four flows I've got this one going in and this one going in and I've got this one coming out and this one coming out and you're making the argument that the rate of change of energy in the control volume is zero and so the energies must balance the energy flows into and out of the control volumes must balance so we've got four ports we've got no heat and thermal energy transfers and we can assume that these things are negligible and this gives us uh, effectively an energy power uh, balance where effectively the inflow of energy must e or the sorry the rate of energy inflow must equal the rate of energy uh, outflow and you can use this to work out the temperatures of one of the streams next one uh, is mixing chamber so this is where you effectively you've got a hot stream and a cold stream coming in and the mixture flow coming out is the sum of the energies coming out so same sort of thing as what we had before here's the steady flow energy equation uh, three ports no therm no work or thermal transfers potential kinetic energy transfers negligible and we come up with an equation that looks a bit like this Okay, so um, we've covered the steady flow energy equation. We understand where it comes from, the first law. Um, we went from a system to a control volume. We've added in all our various um, forms of energy. Um, we made an assumption that it's inviscid to sim simplify the convective terms. We assumed it's steady, um, and we've come up with a sort of a simple energy balance uh, equation and provided some examples of how you simplify it and how you use it to answer questions. Okay, thank you very much.